welcome to this review of my IBM 5152. I've been wanting to do this video for a long time, and now I can finally show it to you, my very own Beamspring keyboard. I've previously shown a 3278 that I had on loan, which was in excellent condition and which had already been pre-converted. But while this one is about as immaculate as you're going to get from one of these things, it still had to be converted to USB, and that's quite an adventure which I'll happily tell you about in a later part of this video. First though, let's have a look at exactly what it is. This was the keyboard to an IBM 5251 display station, a terminal computer from the late 70s. It had a resolution of 80 by 12 characters, and although I'm not completely sure, I don't think it was capable of graphics. It was similar to the 3278 I showed earlier, but the 5251 came out several years later and looked different. The main reason why both keyboards are so highly coveted nowadays is because of their switches, which are called beam spring switches, or beam and fly spring interlock as IBM calls it in their patents. These switches were the go-to switches that IBM used in the 1970s, but in the early 80s they were replaced by a cost-saving and reduced height new switch that IBM had developed. Care to guess which one that is? Yes, buckling springs. I know, it's hard to imagine nowadays, but back then the Model F was IBM going all cheapo. The Model F switches are still amazing switches though, and they were actually more dust resistant than beam spring switches were as well. They were later replaced by a cheaper, non-capacitive, membrane driven version that would power the famous Model M, or enhanced keyboard, which again was a cheapening of the product in response to dropping computer prices. The Model M still feels excellent, but it's a little stiffer, not quite as crisp, and it doesn't have the N key rollover that the Model F and beam spring keyboards have. So, if the Model M is the secret older alternative to modern mechanical keyboards, and the Model F is the secret older and better version of the Model M, then beam springs are the even secreter uh, ancestor of both. We've nearly hit keyboard genesis here, people. Like the Model F, beam springs are capacitive in nature, but they work slightly differently. While the Model F consists of a very simple assembly of a flipper made up of a capacitive plastic that rocks in response to pressure from an attached buckling spring, the beam spring uses a much more complicated mechanism. There are even discrete switch modules unlike buckling springs. That means that unlike the difference between the Model M and the Model F, which are very similar except the F is just a lot better, the beam spring and Model F don't feel quite the same and there are some people that actually prefer the buckling springs. As is often the case, it's down to opinion. So the beam spring switch, about which I'll be doing a teardown video at some point, consists of, well, a beam spring, which is riveted to the slider and which hooks into two metal beams connected to a capacitive piece of plastic that IBM call the fly plate. When pressure is put on the beam spring, it inverts, and the assembly tightens, which results in the fly plate being pulled up. This means that it works the opposite way around compared to the Model F, in which the flippers are off the PCB by default and flap down when you press a key, while in beam springs the plates are on by default and lifted off when you press a key instead. The switch contains an external coil spring to provide the return force, but the tactile force and clicky noise are generated by plate springs, which gives it a distinctly different feel and sound from the purely coil-driven mechanism of buckling springs. While the Model F feels somewhat linear to an extent, the beam spring feels almost free-floating in a way, with a short but sharp punch through something. It's somewhat related to the Alps plate spring switch, which also uses a beam spring of sorts. Those switches are also very pleasant, but although they use more parts per switch than beam springs do, 11 parts versus 8, the driving mechanism is much simpler and the overall key feel is not as refined. It's definitely lighter than the Model F at about 55 grams of tactile force and the airy feel and extreme switch smoothness, seriously, I'm not kidding, it's insanely smooth and it's not even lubed, gives it a very delicate and exquisitely poised touch. It's delicious and although it doesn't have quite as good a switch noise as Blue Alps, plate spring driven switches have a rather distinct noise that's not for everyone, the key feel is just absolutely unsurpassed in my opinion. A 
Of course, beam springs are from an era in which people were used to typewriters, so just to lend the typing noise that bit of extra oomph, they That's right, there's a solenoid in here that jackhammers against the case every time you type. With it turned on, it's by far the loudest keyboard I own. It's so loud I basically can't understand videos of people talking when I'm typing on it. The switches are housed in a ridiculously heavy assembly of heat-treated steel plates and the case itself is basically the Iron Throne. All of this leads to an absurd weight of just over 5 kilos, more than a battleship, or the same weight as 9 of these aluminium Apple keyboards. Yes, if build quality is paramount to you, then look no further, it doesn't get much crazier than this. Dun dun dun. Okay, okay, so it does get much crazier than this. But the Chiron aircraft carrier is quite a different animal altogether, and I don't think anyone in their right mind would pick it over a beam spring. One common problem, though, is that if these are housed in an unhospitable environment, they tend to rust. Sometimes these show up rusted practically to oblivion. I guess this is more of a problem if you live in a nasty swamp or something. Or even worse, East Anglia. This one is extraordinarily clean though, I can't see any rust anywhere proving that you can actually store these with no rust accumulating. The bottom is basically flat plate steel, with no flip out feet. Not that you need to with a keyboard this tall and steep, I mean Jesus Christ is taller than my fist. But there are these massive holes on either side of the keyboard. Now I'm just going to assume that these didn't have flip out feet in them because if they did I can't even imagine how gargantuan they would be. Now that I've converted it, it just has a tiny USB cable coming out of it. But the original cable was an insane piece of kit, it might as well be a piece of rebar. It's quite short, but even at this tiny length, it still weighs a quarter of a kilo. And just look at that plug, it's humongous! The original cable, just like the inside of the case, also has the original manufacture date on it, which is in November of 1982, which is quite late. That's after the Model F had already been introduced. So, how do you go about converting this to this? Well, it depends a little bit on which model you have, but for most beam springs it works like this. First of all, you'll need a converter board. These were designed by Tom Wong Cornell, aka X Watsit, and although they were kinda hard to get hold of at some point, Orialcon sells them nowadays, I'll put a link in the description below. Installing it is actually super easy thanks to the extremely convenient design of the beam spring assembly. The original controller on these is a slide-on piece of kit, so all you need to do is unscrew the ground, then slide it off, slide on the new controller, like so, and ground it. There. That's it. Genuinely, it's that simple. It's a dream. God, I love IBM. And X, what's it? Optionally, if you want the solenoid to work, and it's not a rusted piece of poop yet, you can get a solenoid controller as well. You simply plug the solenoid into the solenoid controller, doesn't matter which way round. There's two pins for it. Like so. And then you plug the controller into the solenoid controller. Uh, that's this way round. Like so and then you ground the controller to the chassis, like so, and you're good to go. Then, that's it, you're all done. So the whole physical insulation is easy peasy lemon squeezy, but now comes the hard part. The kit comes with downloadable software, and because it's meant for use with a wide range of models, nothing is predefined. Moreover, the capacitive circuitry is so sensitive and precise, you need to calibrate it manually for optimal voltages. I mean, seriously, have you ever had to calibrate a keyboard before? How awesome is that? So this is the software right here, which shows the keyboard matrix at the top. It's a 23 by 4 matrix that represents all the sensing positions and whether or not they're detected as on or off. At the moment, they're all white because they're all off and they turn grey when they're on. Now the first thing you need to do is determine the amount of current you need to send through the keyboard to get the right capacitance, or something to that effect. And that's right, we're gonna amp it up. 
So you have to spool through all the numbers to determine a proper value. If you go too low, keys won't register properly. And if you go too high, multiple keys will register for every key press, or keys will start to register as always pressed. There's an auto calibrate feature you can use, but it's not much use until you know roughly what value you want. Even at the proper value, in the case of this keyboard, it's 134, there's generally at least always one or two positions that register is always on. These are just empty positions in the matrix, so because beam springs use inverted sensing, they register as always on. In any case, once you've found the correct current in such a way that all the keys register properly and no extra keys register, like this, you need to set the layout. Now, for this, you can specify the base layer and up to three others if necessary, or even macros and all kinds of other shite. It really depends on what layout you like and what keyboard you have to begin with, but the layout I've set basically has 10 F keys on the left here, escape, caps lock, control, and alt here, a numpad here, and this key I've set to numpad enter because numpad enter is the best enter key. And the back tab key are set to delete because I honestly can't see how people can survive without a delete key. Also, this small return key here is the layer key, and with it, the numpad becomes an arrow cluster with down keys on both the 5 and 2 and nav commands in the corner keys, among a few other things. I've also set the function key plus F1 to toggle the solenoid on and off. Previously, I also programmed a layout for my ping master, which people kept asking me about, but I've lost that file and I can't find it anymore. So now if someone wants to have my layout file for the Beamspring keyboard, I'll put a link in the description to a download where you can get it. Then if you want to use the solenoid, you need to enable that as well under expansion header. Thankfully, you don't need to calibrate the current or voltage for the solenoid, but you do need to set the times for how long the solenoid should be extended and for when it should retract it. In my 3278 video, I wasn't familiar with this and I noted that the keyboard couldn't keep up with my typing speed in many occasions, which was related to this solenoid speed. You can speed up the solenoid to make this less of an issue, but if you set it to too fast, the solenoid might not extend or retract properly. Of course, if you make the extend time longer than the retract time, it will stick on permanently, and if you make both values identical, it will never extend at all. Also, I found that the shorter you make the solenoid delays, the greater the chance of key chatter, i.e. keys registering multiple times per press, becomes. If you switch off the solenoid completely, this issue seems to disappear though. Anyway, once you've done all this, your keyboard is set up and ready to go. The last thing I want to comment on is the keycaps, which are fucking awesome. All Beamspring keycaps are massive boulders of double-shot ABS, but they appear to be from an era before they added those bromine-based fire retardants to the plastic, which photocatalytically degrade the plastic, which turns it yellow. That's why most things from the mid-80s until the 90s that are made out of ABS turn so yellow. I can't recall ever having seen a Beamspring keyboard with yellowed caps, though. The ones on the 5251 have this really cool two-tone grey colour scheme which makes it one of the best looking beam spring models out there in my opinion. It's gorgeous. The key tops are also spherical rather than the standard cylindrical ones you'll find on modern keyboards. They look much cooler and more retro than cylindrical caps, especially with the centered lettering that almost invariably appears on spherical caps, but the edges can hurt your finger a bit if you're not used to typing on them. And finally, one more thing is the mount, which might look a bit weird and as if nothing else could possibly fit on them, but believe it or not, they're the same mount as the IBM Selectric typewriter. Those could sometimes also come with really colorful keycaps, so if you want, you can FUNKY CHICKEN up your board by repurposing Selectric keycaps for your beam spring. So overall, this keyboard is the dog's bollocks, the bee's knees, the cat's pajamas. It's bloody fantastic. It's built like a brick shit house. The caps are ridiculously amazing and the switches are, in my opinion, absolutely unsurpassed. And the 5251 is arguably the best model of beam spring as well. Some other beam springs were smaller, but this one has an arguably better layout, better even than the XT Model F that came after it, actually. The one that comes closest is the White Whale, but that one doesn't have a proper numpad, and the white-only color scheme is nowhere near as nice, and moreover, it needs a different converter from any of the others. So yeah, this is almost certainly the best keyboard I own. I love it to bits. 
<laughs> That's it for this video. It was quite a long one. If you've made it all this way, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard. As with a 3278, first I'll do one with the solenoid off, then afterwards one with the solenoid on. See you guys next time.